Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Bhagam Radian here at the Association of the United States Army's annual conference and trade show here in Washington, D.C., the number one gathering of U.S. Army leaders from around the world. Our coverage here is sponsored by General Motors Defense, Bell, L3 Harris and Leonardo DRS, and we are here on the show floor to talk to uh, Major General Dave Francis, who is uh, the commander of U.S. Army Aviation at the Army Aviation Center of Excellence down in sunny Fort Rucker, uh, Alabama. Sir, congratulations. The stars look great. Thanks, Vago. It's great to be here. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you uh, at Quad A uh, when uh, you were director of Army Aviation. Obviously, we were talking a lot more about programmatics and, and budget stuff. Now you're the operational uh, guy out there. Um, great power competition is something the force is focused on. Uh, certainly looking at uh, how to project uh, power, project fire, uh, project capability under fire. Talk to us a little bit about, um, certainly on the readiness side of things, as Army Aviation is making this huge shift from uh, supporting COIN and counterinsurgency operations around the world. Uh, you know, there's nothing that we don't do operationally without your force being uh, both the backbone on lift as well as on strike. Talk to us about how, in a general uh, readiness standpoint, you guys are getting ready for that big fight. And I want to talk a little bit about different concepts of operation you guys are looking at, different organizational constructs to adapt to a changing threat. Yep. Well, thanks for the opportunity uh, to talk here today. We're very uh, proud of Army Aviation. It is in extremely high demand, continues to be today. Uh, Army Aviation is 83% committed on any given day. That means, and that's across the active component, the National Guard, and the reserves. We are one aviation force, and it's uh, very important for folks to know that 51% of our aviation force resides in the National Guard and Reserve. So we don't go anywhere without the Guard and the Reserve as part of our force. So when we think about uh, how we modernize Army Aviation, how we train Army Aviation, it includes all three of those components on any given day. So how do we do that? We're 83% committed. That means that someone's preparing to go somewhere, they're already deployed, or they're recovering from a deployment. They're also doing multiple things like combat training center rotations and defense support to civil authorities, helping out with hurricane relief operations, border operations, and so forth. So our force is in high demand, and it is, it is committed significantly on any given day. So as we start to think about how we move Army Aviation from where we are today, supporting those COIN-type operations, to large-scale combat operations, there are some fundamental things uh, that, that we need to do. And of course, we, 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 we do that across a range of things. And as the force modernization proponent, we don't just look at the platforms. We're looking at, for instance, doctrine. We, we want to take the MDO concept, which is its concept because we can't execute it yet, and turn it into doctrine which means we have the training, the equipment, and the leadership to do it as quickly as we possibly can. So that will be an evolving process all the way up to and through 2028, uh, evolving our doctrine to make sure that, that we are operating within the concepts uh, and, and the larger uh, joint force that we operate in on a daily basis. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, second is our organizational design. As we, as we bring these design, as we bring these new capabilities in, uh, it, our formations may not look exactly the same way they do today. We may not have the same number of helicopters in a formation that we have today. So we're evaluating those things continuously as we look at how we're going to fight in the future. And so uh, that will necessitate between now and 2028 and beyond uh, organizational changes to Army Aviation so that we can maximize the capability where we need it. We know that we aren't going to get fielded future vertical lift all in one shot. In fact, our Apaches, Blackhawks, and Chinooks will be with us well into the 2040s. And so uh, while we look at bringing in future vertical lift as quickly as we can, we also know that we have to make targeted modernization efforts to the enduring fleet, that's our Blackhawks, Chinooks, and Apaches, uh, it, so that we are ready to fight tonight well into the future 2028 and beyond because this fleet will be with us uh, for quite a while. Uh, and we know that we can do that and, and that, that we're ready to go. Uh, certainly, as you go through the rest of those things, the facilities may change, uh, the way we train our leaders, and I would like to talk about that just a little bit. Our, the, the, the privates, the lieutenants, and the W1s, the warrant officers that we're bringing into the force today are the future battalion commanders, sergeant majors, and, and standardization instructor pilots of 2028 and beyond. And so how we train those leaders to operate in, in an environment where we're doing large-scale combat operations is different than COIN. And some of the leadership traits are different. We need independent thinkers that can operate off of mission commander's intent. And uh, we have to be able to produce leaders that can operate in those, those uh, 
challenging environments. And so we're working very hard on that. That's, that's an immediate issue for us because the leaders we're producing today are the ones that are going to lead the Army into the future and Army aviation into that future. Um, and uh, multi-domain operations, of course, that's the concept, uh, the joint warfare concept that each of the services has been talking about for some time and, and moving to that uh, brighter future. Um, what are the different kinds of operating concepts and concepts, or I should say concepts of operation, uh, organizational structures that you think are going to be necessary in a great power future where Army aviation, you know, we, we just got off of uh, Air Force Association, uh, you know, the Air Force's model, and, and you have this the same challenge, albeit at a somewhat slightly lo lower speed, which is distributed. You can't have centralized mm -hmm. um, units. You can't have a lot of airplanes in one place. Uh, the logistics is going to have to move with you. We're going to be talking to General Royer uh, as well as to General Mohan about that. But tell us a little bit about how you may have to be thinking and operating very, very differently in the future and what those, you know, if you can give the audience a taste of what that's going to look like, given that the structure of Army aviation has pretty much been the structure of Army aviation for quite some time. So we've gone through modifications over the years, but just to, to answer your question, as we move into the future, we see us having to operate from uh, uh, areas of relative sanctuary and bringing capabilities together at the time and place of our choosing to, provide, to present multiple dilemmas to our, uh, to our adversaries out there. That is going to require a difference in the way we train, equip, and organize. And so we're looking at that. So how you sustain a, uh, a fleet that has to operate over extended distances in remote locations is going to be different than the way we do it today where we have much more of a hub and spoke type uh, scenario uh, based on the way our aircraft are maintained. Uh, we're designing some of those capabilities into these future aircraft so that we don't have to touch them as often from a main maintenance point of view. They're much more sustainable and it'll, 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 there'll be a longer time between periods where we have to do large scheduled maintenance uh, on these aircraft. So those are some of the things that we'll do. Uh, other technologies out there, additive manufacturing, 3D, uh, 3D printing that allows us to produce parts much more forward are really going to change the way we sustain not just Army aviation but even other elements of the Army right now. So all of those things are in consideration right now as we move into the future. Um, let me uh, talk to you uh, about um, a capability. Um, obviously, the uh, future armed reconnaissance aircraft is, is very big. You've got uh, a couple of uh, companies here who have made quite a bit of investment to try to uh, mature designs. The Boeing Sikorsky team, uh, we've got AVX as well as uh, L3 Harris, and of course, Bell uh, working on their uh, 360 Invictus uh, design, and uh, the other one's the uh, Raider, uh, which is the Boeing Sikorsky airplane. Um, talk to us a little bit about what this airplane is and what is it what it's supposed to do because there were some folks who look at it and say this is perilously close to what an attack helicopter should be doing you know it's a lot more than what a Kiowa warrior uh, was supposed to do you've got a lot of internal carriage you have a very very cool weapons bay that you guys have specified that you want each one of these companies uh, to have for a capability and if you could shed some light on that as well well how's the right way to think about this and how are you thinking about where this airplane fits in the continuum of what you want your future attack helicopter to look like what you want your future lift systems to look like because you're looking at an integrated package in terms of being able to deliver everything from scout and reconnaissance to strike all the way to heavy transport. Yep. Well, th thanks for the question. We're, we're very excited about the future attack reconnaissance aircraft and the way, uh, the way it's going to fit into multi-domain operations. So I, it's, it's, it's not a good way to think about it. Is, it's just replacing the OH-58 Delta. It is going to replace the Apaches that are currently in our cavalry squadrons. That's, uh, that's our going in uh, position right now. But what uh, FARA is going to enable us to do is over extended distances be able to uh, assist in the penetration the, and, and penetration of A2, AD defenses and then the disintegration of those. And that's going to be made possible by the leap ahead technology that's being uh, developed into this platform. It's going to give us the speed, reach, lethality and the payload uh, to be able to not only uh, do the penetration but then to be able to uh, disintegrate the integrated threat systems out there, integrated air defenses, integrated fires complexes that allow us then to exploit that opportunity uh, with the use, with the, with the parallel use or the, the complementary use of the future long range assault aircraft, which will, have, which will have additional speed and payload capability to allow us to operate and give us the standoff required for survivability. Uh, because we have, uh, in fact, we think that Army Aviation uh, is not only going to be survivable, in fact we're doing physics-based modeling against 
threats, our most uh, significant threats out there that is proving that not only are we are in the lower tier, are we survivable, but we're decisive in that environment. And the, the future attack reconnaissance aircraft and the future long range assault aircraft are going to give us the capability to, to execute those things that we want to do in multi-domain operations. Um, and how do you respond? I mean, even, even some Army aviator friends of mine have said, like, well, wait a minute, you know, that tends to be the purview of the U.S. Air Force in order to be able to take uh, suppress enemy air uh, defenses, for example, to open up those corridors. That's why they've got a stealth bomber force and everything else. How do you respond to uh, the, the charge that actually Army aviation is actually uh, empirically more vulnerable, right? I mean, how do you counter that? Talk to us a little bit about uh, the research on the one hand, and also how you're cooperating with the Air Force very closely, given that that was one of the Air Force's uh, and the U.S. Navy key mission sets on, on how Army aviation would contribute to that team effort. So we know that multi-domain operations are inherently joint. Okay, so we're going to be working with the Navy and the Air Force and, and uh, other components, other nations, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, those that argue that Army aviation is survival are not looking at data. That's, I think that's primarily anecdotal, and it's based on uh, folks having past experiences. Uh, our modeling, our physics-based modeling, is, is, is proving to us that we are, in fact, survivable in the lower tier. We're not trying to replace the Air Force and their capabilities, but we are, as we bring all of those capabilities together simultaneously and we achieve convergence of effects, uh, we are going to be successful and decisive uh, in future fights. So uh, we are, in fact, survivable, and we think decisive uh, in Army aviation for in this future fight. Um, uh, walk us through then, um, right, uh, if, you, if you look at it, um, even at 180 knots or 135 knots, I mean, folks have to bear in mind that the Kiowa was a 90-knot airplane, so all of these new airplanes are a lot more uh, capable. They've got a lot more payload. They're going to have a lot more speed. How does this fit, you know, as you said, these replace the Apaches that are in that scout role and the cavalry role, uh, but then you've also got an Apache replacement program that you're looking at. What are the attributes that that heavy attack helicopter has to have for the future? So we know that uh, the Apache is going to be with us right now. So the future attack reconnaissance aircraft is replacing the Apaches. The Apaches uh, were, uh, were put into cavalry squadrons because it was, that was a forced upon us by sequestration, quite frankly. Uh, and it was never designed to be a scout uh, helicopter. Uh, the future attack reconnaissance aircraft is going to be able to give us that reconnaissance and security capability in addition to uh, a lot more capability in terms of lethality and uh, payloads that, that, that uh, we're going to operate with. Okay, we're also, we're, there's going to be an ecosystem of capability around the future attack reconnaissance aircraft that will even further extend our range, our lethality and our capability. Air launched effects uh, will be one of those things, which which is uh, basically drones with various capabilities on them that will be launched off of these aircraft that extend the range, increase the standoff of these uh, aircraft, increasing survivability, and allowing us to achieve that penetration and disintegration. Uh, and uh, is that what that, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, that Q bay that's on uh, the aircraft, I mean, you guys have specified a certain box size that you want, uh, each of the competitors have. Is that for deployment of more than just weapons, but also a variety of different payloads? So and it will be. So we're not we're not tied down to that. We want the space so that we have the flexibility in the future to put whatever we need to in there. As we develop uh, longer range capabilities, long range precision munitions, and other capabilities, we want the ability to hang them off of those aircraft and put them in those bays, including on the electromagnetic spectrum. Absolutely. Um, let me take you to, I'm going to keep pushing you, but I'm not going to push you any farther on that uh, because uh, I know there are limits on what you're going to be able to say. Uh, and I should also correct myself. I corrected myself in uh, our conversation with Dr. Jenny, and I called it, uh, I, I got far right the first time, and then I screwed it up the second time. So it is the future attack reconnaissance uh, aircraft, uh, as opposed to the future armed reconnaissance aircraft, which was startlingly like Comanche, uh, which one of the uh, contenders, the Bell contender, looks is, or is reminiscent of. Um, let's talk about battlefield lift. Um, the um, Army, uh, through the Night Court process, had decided that the Block II version of the Chinook was going to go away. Um, there was a lot riding on that. You and I talked a little bit about that when we were in Nashville uh, for Quad A. Um, effectively, the Army had not upgraded a lot of its other Chinooks to try to get to this Block II th uh, standard that gives you 4,000 pounds more lift, which is a huge increase in payload in terms of what, the, uh, what an already extraordinary aircraft uh, can carry, and that is the backbone of how the United States Army moves. And that 4,000 pounds was important to move howitzers, uh, newer generation Patriot batteries, and what have you. But one of the points that then Army Secretary Mark Esper, now Defense Secretary Esper, said is, look, 
but you know that's quite a lot of money for 4,000 pounds. Let me think what kind of lift I need for the future, and that might be actually significantly more than 4,000 pounds I need to lift. As you go and look, uh, there's, it's the only aircraft in the inventory that's been in the inventory since 1962 with some data plates, uh, albeit completely remanufactured, but data plates are data plates that are uh, attached to an airplane. What, what does a battlefield lift system need to look like for the future, given that everything the Army has is, is heavier, uh, we're trying to keep a limit on what troops carry, but troop loads are, are going up. Uh, and especially if we're going to be in an environment where everybody's going to have to move, you're going to have to move more logistics, more fuel, more equipment, more people. What's the kind of foundational lift, heavy lift aircraft you need out there? So let me just address your, your first question on the, the Block 1 versus uh, Block 2 Chinook. So our senior leaders have to make risk decisions and, uh, you know, Quite frankly, the, the uh, CH-47 Fox is an incredible aircraft uh, and uh, is our newest fleet. And so we have the longest before we have to do something to that aircraft in terms of recapitalization or uh, remanufacture of those aircraft. So uh, the CH-47 uh, Block 1 is a great aircraft. And, and I, I think that as we move into the future, uh, there will be future decisions on, on, on where we go with that. Uh, I, I believe that uh, we still have some capability to look at in terms of what the future of heavy vertical lift looks like in the future. Uh, you know, we, we look at Cape Set 1, Cape Set 2 with future vertical lift, and the, the future of heavy lift is Cape Set 5. Uh, that's out there into the, well into the future right now, and we, 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 still have, we are still working on what the requirements of that look like, knowing that, uh, as you said, uh, we're going to be flying more, more stuff farther uh, and potential heavier loads uh, over distance and time. So we're evaluating all of those things, and uh, we'll, we'll, that'll inform our future, the future of heavy vertical lift. Um, you're the person who's got to deliver uh, capability at the end of the day. There are a lot of budgetary questions. I mean, this is a rather comprehensive renaissance in terms of capability. Um, what, what happens if you don't get as much money? I mean, do you have a tiering plan here on some of the puts, takes, and choices you may have to make if you don't get as much of everything that you need in order to modernize the force? Yeah, so we, we appreciate the efforts of Congress to give us consistent, predictable funding. And uh, certainly thank them for the budgets that we've gotten over the last two years. Uh, as you know, we're in a continuing resolution right now, and that, that certainly slows our programs down. And, and we're, we're hopeful that uh, they'll be able to resolve that here very quickly. Uh, so that we can go after the modernization priorities. We cannot afford not to modernize. Uh, our adversaries are developing capabilities that require us to have the leap ahead technology that Future Vertical Lift provides. And it's very important for us to, to maintain our, our edge and our, our asymmetric advantage, uh, particularly in Army aviation that supports uh, our Army aviators, multinational fights, and the joint, joint force as well. Uh, as the budgets come in, we yes, we have to we we'll, we will have to deal with uh, what Congress gives us, and uh, we will certainly prioritize those things and uh, uh, balancing between the enduring fleet, which will be us with us for many years to come, as well as bringing that uh, new capability and that leap ahead technology that Future Vertical Lift brings to the to the battlefield. Um, one very last question, and that's the length of the sticks. I mean, fundamentally now, Army attack helicopters uh, have got a gun. They've got uh, hydro rockets that are much more precise than they ever were uh, in the past, which is a massive advantage, but fundamentally it's the Hellfire missile. What are the kind of ranges you want to equip these aircraft with and the kind of battle networks that will be required to cue them uh, to make sure that they're hitting their targets because you guys really want to extend the arms of Army aviation much, much longer than they've ever been in the past. Yeah, absolutely, and we have several things in the works to address uh, our, our range issues. We want to get well out beyond uh, uh, Currently, where we are uh, with uh, Hellfire, uh, significantly beyond that, and we have we are working on capabilities right now that we think are going to get us well beyond those those distances, increasing our standoff and our survivability. Uh, do you want to get any more specific than that when you talked about a kind of a range envelope that right now you know if you were thinking X uh, you know of a of a couple of miles uh, right now, which is where to where you are on an attack helicopter, where do you want to put that range ring? Yeah, it's going to be way out there. <laughs> Dave Francis, Major General, the Commander of Army Aviation, uh, sir. Thank uh, you very much. Ab absolutely a, an honor and a pleasure, and hopefully we can visit you down in uh, Fort Rucker one of these yeah. days. It would be a real treat. Absolutely. Look forward to it.